Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 10 of the Canine Culture Podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking about rescues and senior dogs. As many of you know, I have two rescues. One I rescued as a senior. Her name is Stoney and one we rescued at a younger age. Uh, His name is Napoleon. So just generally going to talk about just rescue dogs first. Um, Some statistics that you guys might find interesting and quite frankly disheartening. Uh, There's estimated to be around 6.5 million animals in U.S. shelters yearly. Um, Only about half of those animals are adopted. So you have 6.5 million animals entering shelters. 3.2 million are being adopted. As you can guess, the other 3 million dogs, or dogs and cats, really is what this statistic covers, but the other 3 million are euthanized. So this is one of the reasons that rescuing dogs has become just so important to me, such a passion, a mission, and I think it's helpful to really let people know of those statistics because I don't think people fully understand how many dogs are dumped and surrendered, or maybe even just let go in the wild, uh, drop somewhere, or just taken to their vet and euthanized because the owners no longer want them. The dog's too old. The dog doesn't play. They had a baby. They had to move. So it is kind of important that we talk about the unfortunate side of having pets. So that's, uh, It's really going to be the focus of this episode. So whenever you rescue a dog, you got to think you're not only saving that dog, but then you're also making room for that rescue or that shelter to bring in another animal. So you're saving so many lives whenever you rescue a dog. But there's a lot of things that you've got to think about before you rescue a dog, because not everyone is a good candidate to rescue a dog. So I think it's really important to think about the some of the criteria for it. Um, So some of the things to think about before you try to rescue a dog. Number one, where's the dog going to stay? Are they going to stay in your bedroom, your bathroom? Are they going to get to run around in the house? Do you have roommates? Do you live in an apartment? Uh, Do you have a condominium association that might be restrictive and or an apartment complex that might be restrictive on dogs. So I think that's the most important thing to think about first is where they're going to stay and what goes hand in hand with that. Number two is thinking about your schedule. So some people work 10 to 12 hours a day outside of the house and you're going to have to think about How is my dog going to use the restroom, get the socialization they need, get the walks they need? So that's also a factor as well whenever you're rescuing a dog. Uh, Number three is thinking about how much time you have for the dog. So this is a little bit separate from your work schedule in that you have to think about the timing. Are you going to make the time to take them on walks, to get up in the morning, to take them outside, to make sure they're fed? Are you going to have time to take them to the vet when they need to go to the vet? So thinking about how much time you can devote to that animal is really important before you start to try to rescue a dog. Uh, Just a few more things to think about. So number four, dog proofing your house. If you have roommates, could be a consideration of what do your roommates leave laying around? What do you leave laying around? Are there cables and wires, different things exposed? Are there short little trash cans that a dog could knock over? You know, are there other things that dogs could get into that could be dangerous or deathly to them? And then number five with the rescue dog, 
regardless of the age of the dog that you get, you're probably going to need to do a little bit of training. And whether that's just you working with the dog or getting a trainer, that's something to really think about. Uh, it, it kind of going to be twofold in that you need to learn as much about that dog as possible before you get them in your house. And you also need to start looking at different trainers. Maybe for yourself, you're looking at different YouTube videos, things like that. So just thinking about training. So let's say you've done all of your research. You're ready to rescue a dog. You're ready to start the process. You guys may have heard the episode with Papillon Pals. It's a rescue in Jacksonville, Florida. The rescue process can be a little tedious and for good reason. So... Oftentimes, these rescues are ran by one or two people doing it just solely out of the goodness of their heart. And so they might not have time to review all of the applications immediately because they're caring for all of the dogs that they have in their rescue. So my biggest piece of advice for you during the process of trying to rescue a dog is to be patient. When we got Stony. We were pretty lucky. I would say it was a six to eight week process, which actually fit our timeline. We were moving from New York to Florida, but the process was a very long application, uh, a lot of questions. The rescue reached out to different referrals that I provided. The rescue reached out to different vets that I provided, so on and so forth. The process was actually even longer for Napoleon. Uh, he was in New Orleans and we were in Jacksonville, Florida. So, uh, seven and a half to eight and a half hours away, which always makes things complicated. If you're adopting a dog, that's a little bit further out. You're probably not going to be at the top of that list for that particular dog. So for Napoleon, it was a, a lot of patience, a lot of determination, just following up. If other homes fell through, just staying patient, making sure he got in the right home. And so part of this application process, in addition to being patient and it being very time consuming, be honest and give as much information as possible. You want to paint the picture for the rescue that you're getting the dog from, really letting them know why do you want this dog and how can you care for this dog? And bear in mind If you're not chosen for the dog, there's probably a good reason. And you might get frustrated and you might get upset. We've actually had it happen to us as well where we weren't the right adopters. And I can look back and be like, you know what? The rescue, they were looking out for the best interest of that dog and they were probably correct. We were probably not the owners for that particular dog. So you may face four no's before you get a yes. But if you're really genuinely wanting to rescue a dog, stay the course, stay the course, maybe even try to get feedback. And again, be very patient with these rescues, but try to get feedback as to why you weren't selected. Perhaps there's something you can change. You know, oftentimes if there's a young child in the house, it's ordinarily not going to be favorable to adopt a lot of dogs out. It's just, there's so many unknowns. Maybe you don't have a fenced in yard again, might not be favorable for most rescues. So there's just some different things that kind of play into the rescue process in general. So let's say you apply, you got the dog. The first few days, the dog really is not going to be itself. Everything is brand new. The dog is in a new home, new atmosphere new humans. So the first few days, it's really hard to gauge how things are going to go. And I think that's really important to remind people. Some people get a rescue dog and in the first 24 hours, they're like, well, the dog doesn't like me. I'm just going to return it. You got to think it's, it's all brand new. So the first few days, the dog is so confused. And again, just patience. You're going to have to bear through a little bit of that time. And quite frankly, in my experience, it goes beyond a few days. It ends up being, I'd say for Stoney, it was several weeks, almost, I'd say one to two months to really get acclimated. 
Uh, and she's still kind of learning and being socialized and getting around people and learning different things. For Napoleon, it took a little bit longer. It was a, it was a process. We changed his food and his medication, different things like that. He had never been socialized. He had never been trained. So we're seven, eight months in, and I still don't think he's fully adapted to our lifestyle and the people we have coming around, things like that. So patience, patience, patience. If you don't have the time or if you don't want to devote the time, you need to be very careful about the dog that you're rescuing. Like I said, get as much information as possible. So along with the first little bit of adopting the dog, let's say the first two to three months, just some things to think about are going to be socialization, uh, making sure the dog is exposed to people, other animals, different sounds, smells, textures, things like that. Uh, Food, you've got to think about the food. So I truly believe it is best practice to try to use whatever food the rescue was using when you got the dog in the beginning. And if you're going to transition it, you start to take a little bit of that food away and mix it with whatever food you're going to introduce and keep doing that. Say it's a 90, 10 ratio and working your way into that new food. The dog already has so much going on. They're anxious and you don't want to cause any more GI issues than you have to. So just being careful with that food, you got to think about potty training I got two rescues that were not potty trained and you might get lucky and get one that was, but that's something to think about. That's extra time. You're going to have to create a schedule. You're going to have to work with them on potty training. Along with these first few months, you're going to learn the dog and what they need. So for us, rescuing Stoney, who is a senior who was subject to a puppy mill life. She was the main mommy dog. She was part of a breeding situation. We had to gain her trust. We had to show her that we weren't going to hit her or abuse her and that we just wanted to love on her. Uh, For Napoleon, he came to us very aggressive, very reactive. And so a lot of that learning process was learning his triggers and what sets him off. What does he get scared when he's faced with it? Uh, So just learning that. Just some things to think about when you are rescuing a dog. It is very satisfying, but I understand that it's not for everyone. And so if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to talk to you about how rescuing a dog has gone for me, uh, maybe some different options that you have. And I would suggest reaching out to your local humane society, your local shelters, your local rescues, and trying to work with some of these rescue dogs going on walks with them, working on socialization with them, getting in a little bit of volunteer time. So you're kind of exposed to multiple rescue dogs to kind of see how all the different personalities, how they react, how they interact, different things like that. And believe me, the shelters and the rescues, they need volunteers right now. I think I saw in New York City, actually, some of the rescues there were begging for people to come help them walk the dogs. Similarly, I I saw the same thing in New Orleans recently. A lot of those rescues just need people to come walk their dogs. I know here in Jacksonville, many of the rescues have needed more fosters. So that could also be a great way for you to get your feet wet, foster a dog for a sleepover, maybe for a weekend. Uh, And shelters do it too, especially around the holidays, like 4th of July, it's a great time to try to have a sleepover with the shelter dog because they're terrified in those shelters, especially with all the fireworks and all that excitement. So that's just rescues generally. Uh, Like I said, any questions, feel free to send a message to one of our social media pages or send an email caninecultureculturepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, So moving into the second segment of this episode, which is going to be a little bit short, but just touching base on seniors. So many of you know, I have a soft spot for senior dogs. I think many people would be genuinely surprised at the number of senior dogs that are dumped 
that are euthanized just because, um, that are just gotten rid of, dropped at a shelter because they're older, because they have more medical bills, because they don't want to play anymore, because their teeth are bad. So there's such a need for people to take these seniors in. And I think I've discussed this quite a few times, but I'm just going to keep hammering this home. I want to grow this podcast to get more and more awareness and more knowledge around these issues. And eventually I do intend on opening up a senior care facility, kind of like an end of life facility or hospice care, if you will, for small dogs. And you might think that's crazy. There's not a need, but you wouldn't believe how many dogs are in need. I know that there's a rescue here in Jacksonville who the lady just has nowhere right now to take her senior dog and the rescue is going to have to make room for this little senior. Their owner is elderly. She can't take care of the dog anymore. So there, there's always a need. So senior dogs, they're easy and yet they're hard. If that makes sense, because they need, they do need less exercise. It's less playing, but at the same time, you've really got to think about their food restrictions movement restrictions, just keeping them comfortable. So if you're thinking about adopting a senior dog, the number one thing I would not even caution you about, but just somewhat mention so that you're aware are the medical bills. The dogs, a lot of these senior dogs might have different issues with their joints. So arthritis issues, um, different issues with their back. You know, if you have small dogs could have issues with their trachea, with their heart, with different organs. And then you get into all the different dental problems and vision problems. So just knowing up front, when you get a senior, you probably are taking on some medical bills. And that's not to say that all seniors will have medical bills, but I do think that some some bills are inevitable, of course, with any dog, regardless of age. But that's something to think about. If money's a little tight for you, or if you really are struggling paycheck to paycheck, I don't know if a senior dog is for you. And quite frankly, I don't know if any dog is right for you. I think you need to put yourself in a good financial position before you make that commitment. And there's, of course, resources out there. Again, I would love to discuss those, so feel free to reach out. Um, So number one, medical bills. Number two is food. Uh, Seniors do sometimes need a different diet or a unique diet. So what we do for Stoney is she eats the same kibble as the other two dogs, but we soak it in water for about 20 to 30 minutes to soften it up. And then we mix it with a little bit of wet food. And in there, we do add a CBD oil. We do the Max and Neo CBD. We do uh, fish oil. We do the Nordic Naturals. And then we do a glucosamine chondroitin MSM supplement. And we're actually in the process of switching, so I can report back on that. But these are all items that Stoney gets in her food on a daily basis. And she'll sometimes get like mashed up blueberries, mashed up green beans, different things like that. That's just occasionally, that's like a little treat. Uh, Number two for seniors, something to think about is exercise. So while they don't need as much, they still do need some, and they might need a little bit of motivation to get it done. So for Stoney, with her knee and hip problems, she she has a little physical therapy regimen that she does, And we honestly only do it a couple minutes a day, some different little planks, little side steps, some, just some different things that her physical therapist provided for us. And that really does help her move better, feel better, sleep better, keep away some of the stiffness and the aches and pains, just like a person. They need to keep moving, but you can't overdo it. So another thing to think about with seniors is just their overall comfort. So for us, we have little doggy stairs that go to the bed 
and little doggy stairs that go to the couch. So that's something to think about. Does your dog need stairs? Do they need a ramp? Maybe you could build a ramp for them. We've used a ramp in the past and we're, we're quickly approaching needing a ramp now. Uh, beds. We have doggy beds in every room just so the dogs are comfortable. We want to make sure they're as comfortable as possible, especially our little seniors. And then one thing that we've recently done are motion activated lights on their doggy stairs. So if a dog needs to get up in the middle of the night and they need to get a drink, they have a little light that is activated for them so that they can see because our dogs, as they get older, they can't see as well in the dark. So that's pretty much everything that I have for this episode. I really just wanted to talk about rescue dogs and senior dogs in general. Uh, If anyone listening has any questions, you have anything to contribute, like I said, please feel free to reach out on social media or send an email to caninecultrepodcast at gmail.com. Also, uh, we've gotten some questions and I am trying to fill some of the episodes We have a question submitted regarding seizures in dogs. So if you're a vet or you're connected to a vet that maybe knows a specialist, like a neurology specialist for dogs, and you think that that person would like to come on the podcast, I would love to do that episode. Um, And if there's any other episodes you'd like to hear or any suggestions, please feel free to reach out. Any questions that you want to answer, please feel free to send those in and we can certainly try to get those questions answered for you. So thank you guys so much. Thank you for tuning into the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.